All right, welcome to The Secret Is You. Today is going to be an amazing, amazing interview. I'm super excited about this because, uh, you know, a lot of you that follow me, you've, you've heard me talk about Sean in the past and and some of the books that I've, I've been able to pick up and read. And, and, uh, and today we are so fortunate to have him here joining us. But I want to give him his due because I know that some, we got a lot of new listeners all the time, new people that are kind of tuning in. And I want to make sure that you know Sean Acor. He is a New York Times bestseller author, of the happiness advantage before, okay, and big potential. Let me tell you something. Big potential, as you guys know, has changed my life as a leader. I'm going to tell you it was the best business book that I have read in probably the last five years, without a doubt. A hundred percent. And uh, we'll go in a little bit about that. But he spent the last 12 years at Harvard where he's won dozens dozen of uh, distinguished teaching awards, also delivering you know lectures and doing some of the most amazing work at Harvard. Also, Sean has been, become one of the world's leading experts in connection between happiness and success. And that's what we're going to be talking about today is how are these two things, happiness and success, kind of living in the same world. So, Sean, welcome to uh, The Secret is You. Chris, thank you so much for having me. I am super excited. Now, let, let's get into this because a lot of people, by the way, amazing book, right? Everybody needs to go out and get this one right now. If you do not have this, this needs to be in your arsenal of books. Uh, and it was one of those books I was like, wow, Sean has got it on point. He knows what he's talking about. But I had this big thing when I went out and started talking about this to people, you know, and they were like, okay, I don't understand. In the happiness advantage, uh, uh, you talk about you know helping people connect with their own ability to raise their happiness through their habits. Talk a little bit about what your research uncovered with this. So um, there's oh there's so many places we could start. Um, I, maybe I'll start with the fact that you know I I grew up in Waco, Texas before writing this book, um, and I uh, I was planning on living there in Waco my whole life. This is. This is Waco of the 80s and 90s before Chris and Joanna Gaines fixed it up. Um, but I, I applied to Harvard on a dare, got in. I never expected to get to go there. I was a volunteer firefighter, not a valedictorian. And I got in and got a military scholarship to go there. And I just assumed in the midst of all that success, all these Harvard students would be incredibly happy. And what we saw was exactly the opposite. We saw that 80% of these students were going through depression. 10% of them were contemplating suicide at some time during their four years while in the midst of all of this opportunity and what the external world thought was success. And it led on this journey to realizing that when we started looking in, at the science of happiness in this field called positive psychology, uh, what we started realizing was that success didn't necessarily guarantee happiness within people's lives like we expected it to. If that was the case, then the billionaires and the celebrities would be the happiest people in the world and yet we see consistently that they're not. But what we found when we did this research is that when the brain becomes more positive, if you take wherever you're starting and your levels of happiness start to rise above your, your genes and above your environment, it turns out by creating these positive habits in your life, we see every single business and educational outcome we know how to test for start to rise dramatically when, re when we research it. And many of our health outcomes as well. We live longer. Our symptoms become less acute, our social bonds deepen, our creativity triples. When your brain is positive, you have 31% more productivity. We find that it raises your levels of sales across industry by 37%. Just incredible transformations that occurred, not by thinking once I'm successful, then I'll feel happier, but flipping that formula around and realizing that happiness could actually be this incredible advantage in people's lives. You know, it's so funny, you know, and, and you talk a lot about this as, you, you know, I'm a firm believer too, and what we do is consistent. H how does somebody though become happier? I mean, that, that, you know, that sounds really easy to do, right? And, you know, we're, a lot of people are dealing with credit card debt. A lot of people are dealing with, you know, overextending themselves with a house or, you know, always trying to keep up on, and, and looking at what other people have and, oh, I got to keep up with this person or keep up with that. H how do you find happiness in this world? It's such a great question because in science, we can create happiness very easily when we can control all the variables in a psych, psych lab uh, working with freshman students that we're grading. What we're really interested in is can we create happiness in the midst of the messiness of life? Mm -hmm. When I got into happiness research, I thought I'd be surrounded by ponies and unicorns all the time. I'd be a 
Disney every day. People would be dancing around me constantly. And yet uh, what we found was in some of the most, our, our, we found ourselves in some of the most difficult places in the world. Like I started doing this research, not only with students who were depressed, but bankers who were in the middle of a banking crisis with farmers in Zimbabwe who lost their lands, with uh, schools in the wake of school shootings, with critical care nurses in the wake of the Boston bombing, and with hospitals and schools in the midst of what we saw in 2020, in the midst of a global pandemic. And what we kept seeing over and over again is that even, and especially when life becomes difficult, that's when this research actually has an even higher import within our lives. That happy, happiness in good times is almost a luxury item, but happiness in difficult times becomes a necessity because the brain works so much better at positive, it allows us to get out of that. So the question you pose is I think the, the crucial one, which is how do we create happiness when it feels like life is out of our control? Mm -hmm. um, I, I would, if, if you allow me to, I'd love to say two things on that. One is um, I think a lot of people think that they're just their genes. You're born a pessimist, you die a pessimist, that's the end of the story. Yeah. Or I can't feel happy because of something in my external environment. You ask somebody why they're unhappy, they'll tell you something that's going on in their environment usually, right? So the problem with those is no one, no one listening to this got to pick their parents. So the genes were out of our control, but also the world has become so big, we don't necessarily get to control the environment. So it sounds as if our happiness is out of our control. They were constantly buffeted by whatever is happening to us in the world, whether that's debts or a pandemic, whether that's a divorce, whether that's challenges we see with our kids, we're constantly being pushed around by those things. What we study in positive psychology are the weirdos, the outliers, the people that don't fit the average. Um, because what we got interested in is what about the positive people? Because we always study the average people. Yeah. What about the optimists? What about the people who have gone through so much in their life you know, and having looked through your book and read through it this morning, um, I, you know, the challenges that you had to overcome and that you encourage other people to overcome is not that people are successful and happy because they had nothing to overcome, right? Yeah. What we're finding is it occurs even in the most difficult parts of our life. So what we found when we looked at those weirdos, and Chris, you're, you're one of those weirdos <laughs> I know. we would want to study. What we found was that when you study those weirdos, they change their daily habits. What that means is they were picking up habits that I know have been part of your culture about you know, increasing levels of gratitude, like practicing gratitude within your life. Um, yeah. you know, journaling about positive experiences, exercise, meditation, writing two minute positive emails, transforms people's social connection score, which is the greatest predictor of people's long-term levels of happiness, altruism, humor, music. When we studied those things, we found that given difficult genes and environment, by adopting those habits, those weirdos break the tyranny of genes and environment over our levels of happiness. And suddenly, not only does their happiness begin to rise, but it turns out their success rates and health outcomes and their kids' ed educational outcomes improve as well. And the people in their, their spheres, uh, their ecosystem improves as well. So I got hooked. I've been doing this now more than a decade in 50 countries, just trying to understand what can we do to create happiness when the world doesn't look like we want it to. You know, it's interesting because uh, you and I share a, a philosophy and I, I about making people happy. We would like to serve each other people. We like to see people succeed, right? And it, it's amazing. When you think of all the things you said, journaling, taking some time, pause, all these things, it's not really that those are new ideas, right? This is stuff that's been out there. Do you think that there's a spectrum of happy? Do you think that there are, uh, like if you look at a shirt and Williams paint color selection, that there's all the different, you know, uh, selections that are in front of me, is there a spectrum that, that is happy? Because I, I go around the country speaking 250 days a year, you're doing it, you're doing amazing work. And yet there was a very few people that actually, actually flip the happiness switch or will do the consistent tasks to make themselves happy. And that's why I always ask myself, is there a spectrum? Because why wouldn't more people want to be happy? Why don't they do these exercises? It's fascinating. You know, part of the reason I got into doing this research is because I wanted another language to talk about happiness. So I got started back at Harvard Divinity School and I was studying Christian and Buddhist ethics. So what, my, what I care about is how your belief systems about the world change the way you act in it. How mm -hmm. do you act differently when you see someone suffering? How do you act differently in a pandemic? How do you treat people differently in a business? Um, and what I realized in positive psychology is we got to ask some of those same questions, but we got to do it with another lens, which was the scientific method to find out, you know, 
how do people respond to the world? And, and, and you know, I could say gratitude's good for you, yeah. but what does that actually do in someone's life? And yeah. unless we test it, we don't really know. And what we started realizing was that uh, the average person doesn't fight their genes or their environment. So the majority of humans defaults to their genes or their environment in terms of their happiness. That shade that you're talking about, that, that group of individuals, those weirdos or outliers, those champions of the positive, they actually adopt these positive habits despite their environment, wherever they grew up or what trauma that they were overcoming, wherever they were in the economic spectrum. We find that there are these champions that arise in the midst of these different places. And what I get interested in is how do we become more like those people? Like what mm -hmm. is it that they're doing that makes them, helps them to believe that change is possible within their lives? Now, let me ask you this. Is there really a competitive advantage that you're seeing through all your research that happier people have? It's incredible. Yes. So it's so stunning in the data <laughs> that um, literally there's only two places where uh, uh, um, pessimists outperform optimists and both of them are in the gambling space. <laughs> <laughs> Aside from that, optimists outperform pessimists in every category of their life. Um, and the reason for that is multiple. One is when the brain is positive, dopamine floods through the system. That neurochemical not only makes us feel pleasure, one that you know very well, but also uh, it turns on all the learning centers in the brain, which causes our brains to become these sponges in the midst of the world that we're experiencing. And what we find is those individuals, their productivity rises by 31%, sales by 37%. I did a study at UBS, with bankers in the middle of the banking crisis, we got them simply to identify the meaning involved with their stress, right? So if I tell you someone's failing English, you probably don't feel stressed. But if I tell you your, your kid is failing English, you oh. feel stressed, there's meaning involved with the relationship. What happens is the average person, when they look at the world, they think that they can't change. So they just become very reactive. One of the chapters I loved in your book was the one about being proactive instead of reactive. And that idea of, instead of just being like, I'm overwhelmed with stress in my life, what we had these people do, these bankers, is simply identify why the stress was meaningful. In a one hour intervention, six weeks later, in the middle of the banking crisis, the negative health impacts of stress evaporated. 23% drop in the negative health impacts. That's fatigue, lower job effectiveness, burnout, disappeared for the same level of stress as other people who were just bearing. So what we realized was stress was inevitable it's our lens to which we view the world that changes how it impacts us. And that that happiness, we find that when you cause a, a student to become po more positive, everything we test for on standardized tests in the United States for, uh, uh, for American students rises dramatically when the human brain is positive first. We find that your memory improves, intelligence improves. So what all these categories come into, we could summarize it like this. Every, every business outcome we know how to test for at Harvard Business School rises dramatically when our brains become more positive than our genes. Wow. So the question is, can we do that? And we keep finding these people that can. We can look at people who are genetic, low-level pessimists who have been that way their entire life, and suddenly they change. All right. Here's the question I know everybody asks me all the time. When I get done, and I'm asking you because I, you're the happiness expert, can anybody be happy? And what do people need to understand about being happy? Mm, it's such a great question. I do. I do believe that people can absolutely move in a positive direction mm -hmm. based upon this research. Um, happiness to me is the joy you feel moving towards your potential. And that joy you can experience even when life is not pleasurable. Yeah. In the midst of having high levels of debt, in the midst of uh, going through a divorce, in the midst of uncertainty about the world around us, right? In the midst of those challenges, people can still find joy, right? Um, what I find so fascinating is that we put the brakes on our happiness. There's something called happiness anxiety, which I saw so much in the midst of 2020, where people are, there's two reasons that people experience happiness anxiety. One is they feel like if I get too high in terms of happiness, I'm gonna go crashing back down because that's what life is like. So their brain literally puts the brakes on any happiness so they don't have any of that crash down impact, right? Which means it shuts off the positive. You can experience all of the negative. The other way, which I saw so much in the midst of the pandemic, was that people feel like I can't feel happy if I know other people are suffering, yep. which sounds so noble at first. But again, they're actually limiting their happiness. So you find all these barriers where if I know someone's suffering on my street, 
right? Yep. Me putting the brakes on my levels of happiness or enjoyment or good times with my family or my spouse, finding the deep connection with my friends. If I stop any of that or stop my optimism, my likelihood of helping that person drops dramatically because I don't have the energy anymore. So what I would say is that, yes, I believe people can move in a positive direction. What I keep being shocked by is we keep finding these incredibly happy people that are going through stage four cancer, that are in prison, that are in massive levels of debt, who have uh, gone through bereavement, who are in the midst of some of the greatest challenges we've seen from refugee displacement um, to uh, uh, school shootings. Mm -hmm. And we find these people can still choose to be the positive above where they were in the past. Yeah. So anyone listening who's, who have, has gone through a difficult period in their life and come out of it, they know that change is possible. So if change is possible, why can't we find a way of actually improving our levels of happiness above what we think is our current default? I love it. And that, and I, I, I got to segue into potential here because you know what? Um, I would say, you know, some people might go, gosh, Chris, you've been very successful. You've done some amazing things growing your business. Um, 2019, December, I'll never forget. I'm on the treadmill listening to your book. And um, I was going through one of my most challenging times as a leader. And I was feeling that uh, I was feeling unsuccessful. I was feeling, uh, you know, like I was not hitting the mark as a leader. And there was a piece of the book that started to talk about the people we surround ourselves with or the five people we hang out with. And we started, started talking about, you know, um, some of the research that was done about, you know, 5% of the people create 95% of the problems. And I could be a little bit off on the statistics, but that book made me really sit, that chapter made me sit back as a leader and go, I'm giving my happiness, the control over my happiness to 5% of the people to try to please and serve, which 95% of the people were happy and they were doing this. But the effect that people can have on your happiness and the control that they give and, and big, big potential was a biggest eye-opening book for me um, at that time. C can you explain a little bit about that research that was done and, and how have you seen that play out in other businesses? So um, I started with the happiness advantage, um, which you referenced at the beginning, yep. where I was so excited that we could see people's levels of happiness change, right? We can raise someone's levels of happiness above their genetic threshold, which in and of itself is life-changing. That happiness could be possible even if you've had such a difficult childhood or wherever you are within your life, right? Um, but then when your brain became more positive, your business outcomes improved. So it was all about you, which was so important. But what I was missing out on was the entire ecosystem around that person, right? Yeah. What is happening to people around you when you become more positive? What's happening to your kids when you're finding more meaning and purpose and passion within your life, right? And so, and when they start to become positive, how does that make it easier for you to choose to be positive? So that virtuous cycle that was occurring. So Chris, what you might not know, because I didn't get to write it in the book, is how the book came out. Um, what, as you know, uh, when you write a book, you go on a book tour, you yep. try and get people to hear about it. So you've got this little window, uh, otherwise other books immediately take up our attention, right? Um, so my wife was pregnant when Big Potential came out. Big Potential was all about mm -hmm. changing to look at how you pursue happiness and success in an interconnected way. Um, so we designed it to come out in February, uh, three years ago. And I know it was three years ago, you'll hear why in a second. <laughs> um, my daughter was gonna be born that year. So uh, she was gonna be born in late April. So we thought I'll do it early February, get off the road and be there with my wife and my daughter. The first week of February during the Super Bowl, my wife's water broke oh. um, the, the day before the book launched, um, which, and we didn't know that was what was going on at the time. So the, she got to the hospital, you know, they said, uh, you know, you, you need to stay here for the next six weeks trying to hold this baby in, which wasn't a thing either. And three days later, our daughter was born. So no book tour, obviously, oh. but for the next 50 days, my happiness sat in an incubator in NICU being cared for by these angels. They were keeping her alive when my success rate would have been zero. So instead of talking about this research on the interconnectedness of happiness and success, when Big Potential came out, I got to live it, right? Um, uh, my, uh, my Zoe, my, my <laughs> daughter's name is Zoe Sparks. We didn't have a name for her at the time. We almost lost her three times. She kept sparking back to life. So she's Zoe Sparks Acor and she's doing wonderfully. You'll probably hear her screaming and running around in a little bit. Um, but what, what we got to do is to battle test this research. Uh, 
one of the studies I love that became a model for what we saw happening with uh, companies worldwide is, uh, is the Firefly study, where mm -hmm. they found that if you look at fireflies across the globe or lightning bugs, depending on where you are, they light up in the dark individually and randomly to attract a mate. Mm -hmm. And when they do so, their su success rate of reproduction per night is 3% which is still really good. But it turns out on two sides of the globe, the lightning bugs figured out how to do something different. And instead of lighting up individually and randomly, they found a way to light up and go dark at the same time, wow. simulating a lightning strike. Now they're lighting up when their competitions lit up. Why would you do that? And what we found was when you measure it at a scientific level, eight decades after we discovered them, at MIT, they discovered the success rate for those bugs goes from, from 3% to 82% for all the bugs. So suddenly you realize that this became a model that we kept seeing in nature that it wasn't survival of the fittest, it was survival of the best fit with our ecosystem. So in our organizations, how do we find a way of not telling people, go, go work on your happiness and come back? Yeah. When the greatest predictor of your long-term levels of happiness, as you know, is other people, right? And that as we're creating those businesses, how do we find a way of creating and surrounding ourselves with positive people? And how do we find a way of enhancing them and expanding power out to them to deputize them to help us. So um, one thing I, I wanted to share was that, because um, it, it, uh, you alluded to it just a minute ago, where you know people see you and they're like, well, of course he could be happy, he's so successful, right? Oh, Sean's gotta be happy, he's a happiness researcher. <laughs> he's married to a happiness researcher, right? <laughs> like gotta be easy to be happy if you're that guy. Um, when I got into this research, I got into it because I went through two years of depression mm -hmm. while I was at Harvard. And I had positive genes. I was in a good environment. And yet I went through all this depression. I thought I had to solve it on my own. I thought I had to work really hard at it. I wanted to be there for other people. That was literally my job. My job was to make sure that the freshmen at Harvard didn't become depressed. And then I, I got depressed. So the turning point for me was not only doing those positive habits that we referenced at the beginning that I know are, are part of your culture, but also I had to open up to my eight closest friends and family and say, I've been going through depression um, over the past two years. I have no idea how to get out of this. They called me, they emailed me, they met up with me, they brought me cupcakes, which is not why I did it, but they were great. But suddenly the hills of, uh, of overcoming depression in front of me started to drop because I realized that social connection, my access to joy rose dramatically. And instead of trying to overcome these things alone, we found a way of lighting up together in the dark. So that's what we work with organizations on is, um, and schools and hospitals in the midst of the challenges. Um, how do we find a way of, of seeing that? Because for example, I'm working out with all the public schools in Flint, Michigan. Yeah. Um, and in the midst of all the challenges they've experienced, our goal is to make the teachers happier because we thought if they would be happier, they would stay for more than two years. But then we found out you make them happier, not only does it change the students' test scores, but it impacts that teachers, students, parents or guardians while being on the backside. And suddenly you saw this entire ecosystem being impacted by those incredible positive champions that choose to make a positive change in the midst of whatever life has dealt them. You know, it's funny because, you know, you, you talk about this, the ecosystem, and I love that fact because it does, it is all of us. And, you know, you believe in expanding your power uh, by helping others, but, you know, in the book too, you talk about this whole thing for the first 20 years of our life, everything is based on our individuality of happiness or our individuality of, of what we do, our personal success, if it's our SATs, if it's our grades, and then we're told we have to work in this group setting and that we got to make everybody else happy around us. Uh, can, can you speak a little bit about that? Because I think that is so true because, you know, the society, you know, when we are, you know, I love, I think you say it in the, in the book, you're like, you know, you know, we call it cheating when we're younger and we call it collaboration when we get older. Why is that so important in, in the workplace today? Yeah, I, I think it's fascinating because, you know, I have uh, little kids. So one of the pieces of praise I would give them was like, wow, you did that all by yourself, right? Which is exactly the praise we all got. But as I was thinking about it and looking at this research, I realized that that's where we stop. That's where people think one person's successful and doesn't matter about their team or their ecosystem at home or at work, right? Yeah. Um, you can be a superstar. You just can't be a superstar a star alone, right? What we're finding is that uh, one of my favorite examples is uh, happened on Wall Street. They were looking at these Wall Street analysts who continually knocked it out of the park. They're just 
amazing um, and in terms of the returns that they kept getting. So people were like, they're financial geniuses. They're great at selling. No wonder they're amazing. They're the, the shining lights. So brilliantly, the researchers decided to follow them when they went somewhere else. And they should be equally brilliant somewhere else. <laughs> and it turns out when they followed them for five years, 70% of them could not achieve anywhere the, near the successes that they had at the previous firm. 70% of them, which was incredible because what you started to see was those people were so successful because of the team that they had. You move teams and suddenly your success level is much lower. We see that with professional sports teams. We see that with people that move mm -hmm. around, which is why the ecosystem is so important. You can have a brilliant child go to the best college, but if they don't find the right fit, they, they, they fail or flounder. Yeah. You know, you think about this too, but also not only finding the right fit, but also the right people. We always tell our children to hang out with the right people, right? Don't get caught up in the wrong crowd. Don't, you know, don't go out with Jimmy or don't go out with Betty because, you know, they're, they're on the more wild side. But when we get to our work life, you know, we start not navigating that any better than when we were children. And I see that being a huge piece of the book that I, I looked at. And I, I tell people all the time, look at the five people you're hanging out with because you'll become an average of them. But the question always comes back is, how do I get away from the five, the people that maybe I need to kind of shed out of my five? How do I like really start pruning my five? And do I interview for the five people I wanna be out, you know, hanging out with that's gonna help lift me up? What would be your response to something like that? Oh, it's a great question. Um, I think there's a couple avenues based upon the research that we're seeing. Um, one of them is that um, when you look at addiction research, it, it's very difficult to stop an addiction if you don't have something to replace it with, mm -hmm. right? So as people are trying to drink less coming out of the pandemic, right? Yeah. Like you need something to celebrate in the evenings, right? So like if you don't have something else, like a show or some ice cream or whatever it is you're going to put in that place, you default, like what, am I, what else am I going to do with this time except for drink, right? Yeah. So what we're finding in the midst of this is that if you're going to replace one part of your social system, you need to be able to, or if you're going to, if you want to change it, you have to be able to replace it, right? Um, which means we need to be able to, to explore that. What I find oftentimes, now this is anecdotally not from the research, is we find that, um, uh, that a lot of people, they know those people in their life. Like I have a friend, um, you know, that is in my life that every time I talk to him, I feel encouraged. I suddenly realize I'm growing a whole bunch. Like I feel like I, I talk about these spiritual things that I really care about that I don't normally do and I'm becoming reactive to yeah. the world like you're talking about. Um, that's a person that I need to be talking to at least every month, like, cause he doesn't live here, right? Yeah. And yet I just keep talking to the same people at work or whoever emails me, right? Or whoever puts something on my calendar who they're trying to like they're going after their happiness, not necessarily going after my happiness, right? So if I think about the five people I want to surround myself with, I think a lot of us know who that person is. Yeah. And we want to, uh, we need to just increase the amount of time we're spending with those people. That could be a two minute positive email. That could be a five minute phone call while you're on a brisk walk, right? Yep. Whatever it is, you could have that opportunity to bring more of that person into your life. But the other side of it is, um, I started realizing that those five people we were talking about, I realized one of them for me was uh, was the news, <laughs> you know? Like <laughs> yeah. I realized I was, you know, sometimes I make more eye, eye contact with my webcam than with my beautiful wife, right? <laughs> and like, I realized that I had all these influences in my life that when I was talking about one of those five friends, really one of them was probably social media and one of them was the news. And both of them, at least in the form I was using them at the beginning of the pandemic was negative. Right. So I had this constant influx. So I actually had to switch it to start listening to people who were talking about positive things in their podcast or listening to uh, positive books or yeah. like, I love fantasy books. Listening to fantasy books gave me an, an out to think about something else that was a positive uh, interaction within that world. So what I started realizing was it was virtual and in-person um, people that I needed to change within my life. Um, the last thing on that one, because I don't want it to sound too easy, yeah. but I think it's partly thinking through strategically, how do I be proactive to go after those positive people? Because those people make me better, right? Um, but the other side of it is that oftentimes when we think about the negative people in our life, um, or we think about happiness research, we immediately start thinking about the most negative person. Like, man, I wish that person would change, right? We know the family member, we want to read the happiness advantage, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're like, how do I give this at Christmas without being at awkward, being at awkward, <laughs> right? You know, what we found was uh, that, if, if you want to change that person, 
you actually have to change their social influences too. And social influence is two things. It's the strength of the message. Yep. So you can become the strident, positive person who's constantly in your face about positivity, which turns people off sometimes. Or you can go for that middle tier in a company or in a family that could be shifted by that positive or negative person. And with that group, that's where you spend your time and energy. You try and tilt them towards positive by role modeling positive behavior, uh, giving them positive habits to do with you, like uh, yep. it, expanding power out so they get to lead those positive discussions or start with gratitude exercises at the beginning of a, uh, a dinner or at the beginning of a Zoom call. And once you shift that middle tier to positive, what you've done is you've increased the end, the number of sources. So your strength in terms of social influence gets magnified if you can recruit positive people within that person's sphere to get them to change. When that occurs, it's harder for them to constantly complain all the time because it's countercultural now, yep. right? It's harder for them to show all the deficits because now it's counter to the culture that's focused on meaning and connection. You know, it's so funny when we talked about this and, and I, I, I referenced when I went on to, I referenced your, the, your, this whole, your big potential book. And I talked about that And the first thing everybody's like, they went out and go, I'm, I'm getting a coach to help me become happier. And I go, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's the, the, the five you need to like put into your list. I think we could start with some other things about going out there and get coached. I mean, I think some people think it's a quick fix. Like I'm going to go hire somebody and then they're going to take all those problems away from me. Um, and it, and it, it really is the environment that we have to create for ourselves. We have to like figure out what we're going to let's do, what we're going to turn off the people that we're going to surround ourselves. And, and, you know, Sean, it's so funny. I stopped talking to some of the people that were making me feel bad and, and making me feel, you know, not uh, happy or and, and, and really started putting people that were forward thinking thought leaders listening. I turned the radio off. Yeah. I stopped listening. I turned podcasts on. I turned things that were going to be growth oriented because I was lacking the growth in my life. Even though I'm surrounded, you know, I, I have a, a, a large company and, and I have a lot of people and I'm like, you know, uh, I don't need that. I'm already at, you know, I'm already doing pretty well. No, no. I, if I needed that more than ever and I just didn't know it. How does a leader, you know, that's out there, somebody that's leading an organization, how, how did I know how I woke up and I and I do owe you an appreciation because that book big potential did do that it was the eye opening but not everybody is going to go out there read it not everybody's going to go out there and, and take action but maybe a couple steps that people could do uh, to kind of create that environment for them because I feel like when I'm listening to you right now I feel like I'm back in the Bahamas with my ear pods on listening to the book and and I'm like yes go Sean because that's exactly what I did. Yeah, I, I mean, reading through your book this morning, I realized how much of that research we've been doing just validates the approach that you've been taking. Um, I find that it's, you know, when I look at, at you know, what people could be doing within their lives and, and those, those changes we need to make, I spent most of 2020 working with hospitals and schools because they got hit so hard by the pandemic. Um, and what, what I was fascinated by was here are doctors who read all about and learn all about these communicable diseases, all these terrible things that can happen to you from other people. Then they don't avoid, avoid those people. They take the necessary precautions, right? They wash their hands. They you know, put on a mask or they get inoculated, whatever they do. And then they go out and help as many people as they possibly could. They're improving their physical immune system before they try to help other people. I think that the role of a leader, and I know that this is aligned with your thinking, is to make other people's lives better inside that business, inside that school. So the way you do that is you actually start by improving your own emotional immune system. We need to inoculate our brains against the negativity and stress we're gonna experience anytime you try to lead anyone or have a family, right? So for me, that looked like several things. I'll tell you from the research side, the habits we've seen that have the highest level of efficacy and success rate when people try to adopt it, especially post a short uh, conversation like this, we got people to scan for three new things that they're grateful for each day while they brush their teeth. That's it. This is what NASA astronauts do, which I found out this past summer. While they brush their teeth, that, this is amazing. When, when uh, I asked them, I was working with NASA trying to figure out how they create happiness when they're physically distanced several miles from other people, right? Yeah. And they said, the very first thing we learned is we had to create a schedule. And on that schedule, the astronauts had to have positive habits on there. Otherwise, you could be in this otherworldly experience and miss it, right? By day three, you get used to it. So while they brush their teeth, they think of three new things that they're grateful for. 
They journal about something meaningful that happened to them over the course of the day. They have time that they're intentionally designed so that they can con back, contact family members or friends back on earth. They actually wow. gave them time. This is crazy. They gave them enough time to binge watch Game of Thrones, the entire series twice the last time they were on the International Space Station. <laughs> so they literally were looking for how does pleasure and happiness, meaning and purpose have a role to play at the height of science and technology. So journaling about a positive experience each day. Your brain only needs one node of meaning to a judge that day is meaningful. What happens in the midst of a Groundhog Day experience that many of us had is that every day looks the same, but if your brain identifies one thing that's meaningful, it's a pattern maker, it actually starts connecting the dots for you. Or gratitude, that sounds so paltry in the midst of a, the challenges we're experiencing in our life. And yet we found that if you scan for new things you're grateful for each day, your brain is wants to be efficient. It creates this neural background app that efficiently and passively scans your world for the positive. So people who are born as pessimists suddenly build this part of their brain that scans and sees the positive that they never saw before. Um, brisk walks, a lot of families I know in the midst of uh, the restrictions start going on walks with their family. And it turns out 15 minutes of fun, mindful cardio activity is the equivalent of taking an antidepressant for the next six months um, with a 30% lower relapse rate two years later. Um, and the final one is a, a two minute positive email each day. Starting our day, we know we get flooded with a negative two minute positive email praising or thanking someone else. The reason for that, we already know praise and recognition. The reason this actually works is we had people pick a new person each day. And so 21 days later, it turns out, right? Yep. It turns out they started, uh, when we think about our people, sometimes we think it's a small group of people, mm -hmm. right? We forget about our mentors or the people who had inspired us or people who, you know, have their podcast or people who uh, are high school English teachers, right? Suddenly when you write to them, they light up on your mental map of social connection. And suddenly your brain experiences elevated rates of social connection, even in the midst of social isolation. Um, one last one, since we were talking about technology, uh, in the midst of the pandemic, we created a, uh, um, a mental moat. This is one of the things from the book uh, about the first 30 minutes and the last 30 minutes of the day are the weakest times for the brain. You insert a problem there, your brain freaks out because it doesn't have the resources necessary to deal with it. So sometimes you're like stressing about something for three hours a night, this email, and the next morning you're like, that's not that big a deal. And you just write something back, right? <laughs> I've had that over and over again. So the first 30 minutes, and the last 30 minutes of the day, I just don't engage in email, social media, or news. That's it. And it made a huge impact so that my brain could still ex explore those things. It just did it when it was stronger. You know, I took your praise prism and I ran with it too, because I, I was, I, you know, you talk about the environment leaders. We have to create the environment. I think like we have to create the environment that I want to operate in every day. I want people to be positive. I want people to be happy, but I wasn't doing a good job of going out there and giving praise and, and telling people they were doing a great job or just acknowledging that. And you know, I used to blame this all the time on my mom. Oh, my mom didn't give me a lot of praise. My mom didn't tell me how great, you know, and then my mom would say, well, my, my parents didn't tell me, you know, how good I was or tell me I was excelling at something. And so now we make this that it's, it's becoming a hereditary thing or we're telling that, you know, it's the, the cycle of how we are raised in our environment and our family. And, and I sat back after looking at that and, and saying, no, you know, we have to tell people how excited we are that they're part of our lives. I started doing that. I know the exact day. It was January the 3rd. I sent my first one out in the morning. Now, I got up every morning and I sent five out five text messages and I would just send them out to people and, you know, following some of the guidelines of the research that you did. And, and it was amazing how many people would respond back to me and thank you so much for my day. But more than anything, it made me feel good that I was able to put a little uh, light into their day. Or, you know, I forget sometimes that they don't get a lot of accolades. Oh, mom, that was the greatest breakfast ever. Honey, the house smells so wonderful. Or, man, thanks so much for paying the electric bill. I mean, nobody really does that. And, you know, and they don't get a lot of praise for what they're out there doing. Man, it was a game changer. I did that for almost the first 30, 60, 90 days of 2020. And it was a game changer for me. Um, and, and I will tell you that you said something in the book that that releases a dopamine. And is that, is that accurate when you're sending yeah. those out and when people are receiving that? Even before they even receive it, your brain's actually already experienced the win because you get this anticipatory joy of thinking and modeling what that looks like when that person receives that. Right. Yeah. So 
a lot of times when I do this, people don't immediately write back. Sometimes when I do talks um, uh, in, in the past live, like we would have people, I would have people text message someone right then in the talk. And then people inevitably forgot to silence their phones. So you hear this a few minutes later, ding, 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 right around the room as people are getting these messages. And it's the same type of response you're getting that like, I've never had someone say this to me or like, you've never said this to me in five years of knowing you, right? Or like, one I hear the most often is you have no idea how much I needed to hear that today. Yeah. What I realized was that, you know, people are constantly bombarded. They're thinking and uh, cataloging all these deficits and challenges within their life, these fires we need to put out. And that that one piece of praise might be the only one that they receive in a two, three week period of time, right? But we can also be fueled. I've got pieces of praise before that fueled me for months, if not years, right? I'm a happiness researcher. I do this, this speaking just like you all over the place. People oftentimes will be like, well, you probably don't need to hear this, but I really liked your talk, right? Like as if like one piece of praise couldn't possibly matter. And you have no idea how much it does because uh, sometimes I, I, I don't know if you're like this, but sometimes I'm like, I'll, I'll read someone who doesn't resonate with it. Or somebody's like, I don't believe this research at all. Or like people argue with the data or, or they'll be like, you know, it's so easy for him to talk about, right? Yeah. Like, so you get all, I, I, I'm now super, e it's super easy to troll myself in my own brain, yeah. <laughs> given yeah. the things that I've heard. Yep. And so when someone says this really matters, I actually really need to hear that, especially in a virtual world where you don't necessarily get to see the feedback. Are you, are you the same way? I'm the same way because I, I, I beat myself up and, you know, same exact thing. And uh, and they think we have we're always happy. And we, you know, if, if it's because you're a happiness researcher, or because you've been uberly successful and we need to hear it just as much as everybody else. And I feel like sometimes you, you don't get that in return. So that, that moment for me, um, was, was a game changer because I, I started getting that back too. And I wasn't looking for it. You were in the book. Don't look for it. It's not something you should be looking for. It will come. And it did. And I had so many people that started that practice and started putting that into their day that they started saying, man, and it changed their positive outlook. It changed the, the way they thought. And it also changed their view on the world they didn't think of the world as bad as they once did that was that was the big interesting thing as i started talking to a bunch of leaders they're like man you know i just didn't think that these people you know cared for me or liked me or whatever and i'm like whoa why I'm like well i never heard from them and so it did open up the conversation. So I, I got to tell you, I, I know as we're coming to the wrap of this, um, you know, I want to be your praise person. I'm going to tell you that you are an amazing at what you do. Your books are fantastic. Um, I'm a huge super fan uh, that I was very lucky to have you there. And then when, you know, we were talking about speakers for World Conference, which is right around the corner. Um, you know, the team, we all sat down and, and Cheryl came to me and she goes, I already know who you're going to want. I'm like, yep, I want Sean. She's like, all right, we're bringing him in. Um, we're super looking forward to you being part of this. What could, what could our consultants expect, uh, you know, from you, um, as you come into world conference virtually this year, and we definitely want to have you in person. Cause I'd love to spend some more time with you and bring you back to one of our events. Um, but what, what should somebody walk away with, you know, when they come to world conference by hearing you talk? Well, Chris, I'd love to join you sometime live too. Uh, I was really looking forward to that. I, I think looking, you know, if someone's uh, going to be joining us, um, I, I think what I try to do in the talk is I take all this research that's way too much that we've been doing for nearly two decades um, and try to find the things that to me had the, the biggest impact upon my life. Um, so it's almost a fire hose of information. What you're going to hear are things that are not only going to impact you, but if you can take any notes, because it's too much information, I know it's too much information. I get that feedback all the time, right? You're going too fast, right? But part of what I'm trying to do is that I know it's not one size fits all for everyone. And that what I'm really looking for is that some of the things I thought I'd cut out of the talk, people later on were like, that was the thing I needed to hear that day. You have, like that was so important. So what I try to do are the things that will impact not only your, your levels of happiness, but we'll also then encourage you to, like, I, my hope is that when you leave the session, you're going to want to tell, immediately email all your friends, all the studies. Like you may never have emailed your friend a study before, but you can't wait to share some of that with them. Or you can't wait to tell your kids around some of our definitions of happiness or how to pursue it or flipping around that formula. So what people will get when they come is not only things I think they can use immediately, but it'll be mindset shifts, which I actually think are the most practical yep. portions of it. And then the behavioral things, what can we do walking away that you can do in your life and that you can encourage other people to do to find a way of lighting up together in the dark. 
Sean Acorn. Sean, if they want to get more information or follow you, where what can they do? Where would they go? Um, uh, positiveresearch.com is where you can find links to a lot of this research. Yep. If you want to go to a deeper dive, Big Potential is my favorite of the books. Yep. Um, uh, I have a free TED Talk. If you don't want to spend money on a book, a free TED Talk that you could watch with your kids. You just look up TED and Sean and happiness and it'll pop right up. Um, or, or you can find me on social media where I try and share positive research with people. Well, I can tell you right now, I know Zoe Spark has been very patient for you to get done with this interview. Um, I appreciate you being here. We can't wait to have you at uh, at World Conference virtually. And we definitely are going to have to get you booked in person to make sure you come back and deliver some more knowledge. It's been amazing. We appreciate your time here today on The Secret Is You. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.